And it was just so like stressful to think that you're going to lose your family. Like some of the thoughts that would go through my mind, like if I was ever asked to leave, I mean, what, what family would I want my family to go to? Oh, wow. So we get situated in there because there was only four seats. We had two kids on the ground and I looked up and it was only our prophet on the stand. And we hadn't seen him for, I don't know if it was a year. And so Warren gets up, he conducts a song, he says the prayer, and then he opens up his notes. And he, as he starts reading it, it's a revelation from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But he called out like 28 men's names and had them stand up. And the Lord said that he's lost confidence in these men and that they need to repent from a distance immediately. And that they wouldn't be able to come back unless they wrote confession letters that matched what the Lord had revealed to his servant Warren. Jeez. As we're going out, I just see women sobbing. And some of the men that were called out, one was my stepdad, my brother-in-law, a bunch of my friends. Like I knew all these guys that were getting kicked out. The mayor was one of them. They had eight or nine wives, 60 kids that were just super faithful. Oh my like they just seemed like solid dudes and now they're kicked out. Like it was so random and sporadic, the people he would kick out. And it was just weird, the mind games that he could play with people. Hey, my name is Shalise Ansola, and this is Cults to Consciousness, where we discuss leaving high demand religions or organizations and finding healing and independence through awareness and true individual sovereignty. As always, if you're only listening and you want to see our faces, you can go to our YouTube channel at Cults to Consciousness, where you can like and subscribe, all the YouTube things that help the algorithm and really make our guests feel supported, our guests who are bravely coming on and sharing their stories. So today's guest, he saw our interview with Ben and he called me up. He was like, hey, I'm related to Ben. <laughs> And I have a story too. And so this is the first time that we are going to be hearing from someone from the Fundamentalist Latter-day Saint Church, the FLDS. You guys may have seen Keep Sweet, Pray, and Obey, the documentary on Netflix that's all about Warren Jeffs. We're going to get into what that means. But this is the first time we're speaking with someone who is actually married within the community. Most people left before they had to get married. So I'm really excited to bring on Christopher Weiler. Thanks for joining us. Man, thanks for having me. And, you know, talking about keep sweet, pray and obey, that was really, really wild to watch that and just bring back a recap of being within the faith. I thought they were really quite accurate when they did that. And my part in that story was like, if you remember Warren Jeffs up there singing or the high school kids performing on the stage, I was a little kid in the audience at that time. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I would love to hear if there's anything that was particularly shocking. So actually, maybe for those who aren't familiar, and I should have said this earlier, the Fundamentalist Latter-day Saint Church is a break off of the mainstream Mormon church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They wanted to continue practicing polygamy when the mainstream Mormon church said we can't do it anymore because the government made them shut it down. So people started practicing in secret, creating break offs. And then through some of those breakoffs, we land with the FLDS that was, I'm not sure who was before Rulin, but when you were there, Warren was leading the group. It was Leroy Johnson, which I was actually a boy when Leroy was there. And we weren't a breakoff. We, we were the true church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Right. Everyone else broke off. Right. There you go. <laughs> there you go. The mainstream prophets are the ones that went astray, right? <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. We, we get some comments sometimes, I think, from active LDS who are just just completely beside themselves that we would even call you guys Mormon. And I'm like, guys, you don't own the Mormon name and they're practicing Mormonism better than you technically because they're following the fundamentals of the original prophets. <laughs> so a little disclaimer there. Right. No, that was a good introduction. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. So when we're talking about the Keep Sweet, Pray and Obey documentary, which everyone should go watch, it is it's a hard watch. I'm not going to lie. It's it's there's a lot of triggering things in there, a lot of CSA and Warren Jeffs, the prophet of the FLDS at the time was sent to prison. And so what's so interesting is I saw a piece on you, Christopher from CNN, and maybe we'll put the link in the description, but it was of you and your family kind of like this expose piece talking about what do you think that Warren's in prison and you and your family were very keep sweet and very like, oh yeah, this is it's awful. I can't believe he's in jail. And, and now that you look back, like, what are your thoughts on that now that you can see yourself? Right. Now, as we go into <clears throat> as we go into some of these stories, I hope it'll help shed light on that because it was definitely a transition to get to where we're now. 
because I was born in the faith and I never had more than one mother. I just had, had the one mom and she had 13 kids. And the, her, the older sibling, she kind of had three sections of kids and we were the last batch. And her and my dad both worked and the other kids kind of just went way astray from the way she wanted. And so she quit her job and she raised us. So I never went to public school. <clears throat> I just went to private school. Mm-hmm. And so Warren Jess was my principal since first grade. In fact, I was wrestling one time with the kids at uh, recess and we both had to go in and see Mr. Jeffs is what we called him at the time. And he puts his hands on the back of our necks and it's kind of squeezed. And he's like, hey, boys, we don't fight in this school. And then one of my next encounters, I remember like he'd stop by our classrooms and be like, hey, how's everybody going? You boys want to arm wrestle? Like as a boy, I thought he was just a super nice guy. He seemed like he was somebody that I would trust. Mm-hmm. There was a... I had a hard time focusing in school with the curriculum that they were teaching me. I don't know if I was bored or what it was, but my teacher felt like I wasn't obeying. So she took me up to see him one of the times. And one of the times that I went in there, then he, she came in and she said, you know, Mr. Jeffs, this boy has an obedience problem. And so he turned to me and he says, Chris, he says, do some sit-ups. And so I'm like, yeah, I want to show him how tough I was. He says, Chris, do some push-ups. So I do some push-ups. He turns to her and says, <clears throat> I don't see an obedience problem. And so I just, I thought he was a nice guy and I loved our people. My family with all my older siblings weren't a part of it. Every time they'd get to their teenage years, they'd, they would leave. And so it was kind of a divided family because I lived in that scenario that it was, we were kind of Gentiles, but yet I was living amongst the saints. And I really felt a, a sweetness when we would go there. We went to the Alta Academy that Warren Jess was the principal there in Little Cottonwood Canyon in Salt Lake Valley. And you just see Rule and Jeff's family just seemed so beautiful. All the kids would be out there playing games. People were well fed. To me as a boy, I'm like, man, this is cool. And so rolling through school, it just seemed really wholesome. I loved our people in, in my in my heart. And there'll be some stories that I tell as we go through this thing. And so in going to school, then I made it to the seventh grade, but I was kind of failing, like I failed fourth, fifth, sixth, and then seventh. And they finally just says, Hey, you can't come back. Oh no. But in that time frame, um, yeah. So I sat home for eighth grade. I went to ninth grade for two weeks back at the private school. And they says, Hey, this isn't going to work out. See ya. And so then my j- sophomore year, I went for a couple of quarters to Brighton High, and then I ended up going to our junior year with my wife. And so we'll kind of see how that connection comes into play. Because the school was so small in the private school, then every year, like if there was a new kid that was added to our class, it was always like, oh my gosh, you know, because there was only maybe 12 of us or something that would come back every year. But so it was sixth grade when my wife came into my class. And, and so that was cool. We got to know her a little bit that way. <clears throat> but then, you know, kind of like the bishops, bishops' kids, they go out and party. That's what happened with us. So it was um, a week before I turned 15. Then we had snuck out and we ended up at this party. And she happened to be there. And so we ended up kissing that night and it was fireworks. <laughs> like, I'm like, I have got to see this girl again. <laughs> That's so sweet. And for those who don't know, you're not supposed to touch or kiss at all. You're supposed to have your first kiss on your wedding day, right? Well, and that's something I, I'm glad you brought that up because we were always taught in school that we're supposed to treat the opposite sex like rattlesnakes because it's all placement marriage. Wow. And so if you even think, if you even think of somebody in a sexual way, then you're clouding the channel of revelation between the Lord and our prophet. Mm. And so, yeah, it was, it was definitely really, really bad for us to be doing that. And so being kids, teenagers, then we, we'd just keep sneaking out whenever we could. We'd talk on the phone whenever we could. You know, this is the old days when you had the cord hooked to the phone. <laughs> so you'd have to somehow get past your parents to talk to each other. But so we'd coordinate it to where I'd wait till my parents went to sleep. I'd borrow their car drive out and pick her up, which was probably a 20-minute drive. You know, I didn't have a driver's license. But I'd go pick her up and we'd just hang out till, you know, 3 o'clock in the morning and take her back home. So we did that for a year. And her brother ended up getting his girlfriend pregnant. Wow. And this is kind of a side note, and it's just a funny story. Because we'd pick him up and her, I'd take him over to his girlfriend's house. 
And then we'd go hang out and we'd pick him up and go back. And then we find out that he would go into her room and, and I thought it was her room. But later I found out that she was in like a bunkhouse with her sister. So he'd really? climb up, I guess. The, yeah. Oh my gosh. I thought it was so funny. I'm like, whatever. But back to the story, <laughs> he gets her, <laughs> he, he gets her pregnant and they rat us out. And I'd already been isolated more than my wife had or girlfriend at the time. And so I didn't feel the pressure that she felt, but she had to go see Warren. She had to see Uncle Rulon. Her parents were so upset. Her mom was just so sad that, that that had happened. And so, so she called me up and she says, Hey, you know, I can't see you anymore. She's like, let me finish up school and we'll see what, what happens from there. But I talked her into going out with me once more. So I went to my parents, went to sleep, borrowed the car, went out and picked her up and brought her back to my room. And uh, we were in there just talking. <laughs> <laughs> There's a knock on the door. I'm like, oh, shit. I get in the closet. <laughs> so she gets in the closet and I open the door. I'm like, yeah. And, and mom just comes walking right in, turns on the light, opens up the closet door. And she's like, Lydia, she says, pick up your stuff. She says, I'll, I'll take you home. And she picks up her stuff and she just says, no. Nope. She says, I'll just fucking walk. Wow. And she climbed out the window. You guys little rebels. She's, oh, she's been amazing. It's, it's been incredible to live life with her. But um, I just like, see you, mom. So I left with her and we walked from Sandy downtown to the foothills. And we stayed there at a friend's house in this old apartment for a week on the living room floor. And then um, from there we went over to my brother's house who he had just a bunch of lost boys there that worked for him in a flooring business. And so these guys I'd already known them, they were supposedly my friend. And so we're just here at this party house and they're offering me meth, Jeez. like snort this, drink this, smoke this. And I'm stumbling all over just sicker than I've ever been puking in this filthy freaking toilet. And I've got this beautiful girl there with me and these supposed friends are hitting on her. So it was just a crazy month living there. But she was always just so solid. She's like, what are you doing? You know, like, this is not smart. And let me jump in and clarify, too, for those who don't know. So we actually just did the interview with Ben. It was about the Lost Boys and about the boys who end up leaving the FLDS. Either they're pushed out or they're excommunicated or they just have an easier time leaving. Because, of course, in a life of polygamy, you need more women than you need men. And so... We were talking to Ben about having, we were talking to Ben about the ways that he was helping these lost boys kind of get on their feet again, but we didn't mention it in his interview, but I know off camera, I had spoken to them about how some of these kids do kind of overcorrect a little bit when you live a life of isolation and restriction and you're not even allowed to drink alcohol or coffee, right? I assume because we couldn't drink coffee in the mainstream church. We could drink coffee. I have to tell you about that. Oh, that's so interesting. Okay. Well, hold that thought. When you live a life of restriction and then all of a sudden you're free and you don't really know what baseline is, you don't know what normal is, it can get scary really fast and it's hard to know what your own boundaries are and what's okay to try and what's maybe a little too dangerous. So that's interesting that you say that, that you were part of a lost boy's home and it was just a little too crazy. Well, and I would have went down that path. And and it's kind of wild because people talk about it being because they they need more women than men. Like the 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 parents loved their children. It broke their heart to see them have to go. But you know, they just wanted to live a life that they wanted to live and they weren't complying to the rules. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of the concept that one bad apple can spoil the whole bunch. And so then they'd try to find a family member or somewhere they could go because they couldn't be in the home anymore the way that they were living. And so I just wanted to put that out there. And, it, you know, it's, it's complicated. I know I have some um, LDS friends that are like, man, I can't believe that you just send your children away like that. And in the conversation with them, I was like, well, you know, like, what if your child was gay? And they just bristled up. And it's like, I would tell them to get right out. Yikes. It's the same thing, you know, it's just they're, they're not com really conforming with the family. And and, uh, you know, Ben's my nephew and um, to see him leave or a bunch of the other family members, it broke your heart. But so now we're back in that scenario where we're living in that lost boy house. We were there for a month. My wife, girlfriend at the time was just amazing, like such a great support to me, kept me from going down super crazy paths. 
And then we moved over to my ex sister in law's house that she was in an apartment and had five kids. And so my girlfriend would watch the kids and then I worked and then we just lived on the floor there. But everybody cut us off. Her parents quit talking with her. All of our friends quit talking to us. The only communication we had was with my mom. She kept trying to figure out what she could do for us. She got us an old station wagon with wood paneling down the side. It was sick. <laughs> and, then, and then we had, um, she got us into school. And so she was talking to Warren or Rulin Jeffs. And Rulin says, man, they're so young. I think we should give them a chance. And so we went in and saw him. And he said, if you guys get married, then you can come home. And how old are you at this time? Just to clarify for everyone. So I'm, I'm 16 now and she's 17. Okay. So she's, she's a year older than me. And when we left, I was 15 and she was 16. And it was good that she was 16 because she had a driver's license. She could drive us around. It was awesome. It's 16 and 17. The prophet is like, all right, you kiddos, you're too young. So we should give you a chance, but you're old enough to get married. <laughs> That's kind of an interesting contradiction there. It is. And so as well, it's, uh, there's a little bit more to that story. But I did want to just point out like the first night that we actually moved out together, like it was just amazing to be able to wake up together. Like I still just remember that memory of just how amazing it is. And it's still that way today. I just love it. Oh, but so, so yeah. So we go in to see him on the first thing, like to get into more details. Usually I don't go into this much details, but since we have time, I will. <laughs> but w when we wanted to see him, then he asked us um, if we had had sex. And I can't remember how he worded it. It might have been on like, have you had marriage relations or something like that? Living the law of chastity. So, yeah, something. And so we'd said yes. He asked her if she was pregnant. And she said no. He says, well, was, what I'd like you guys to do is I'd like you to go home for a year. And then come back and see me. Kind of in the older days, like just leading up to w where we were now in time, then they would allow that to happen. That if you chose somebody, you had to separate for a year. If you still loved each other, they'd let you get married. Oh. And so that's where I think he was going with that. And me, I'm thinking, hey, if this is what it's going to take to get back into the fold, then I'm willing to. And so we went out to the car. And when we went to leave, then the first thing my girlfriend said, and I'll just say Lydia, First thing Lydia said is she says, I'm not going back home. You can do whatever you want, but I'm not going back home. I'm like, well, I'm not leaving you here. And so then we went back to our living room floor. And it's probably a week or so later than my mom called me and says, hey, Uncle Rulin says that if you get married, then you can come home. And that was an en endearing way to talk about him was Uncle Rulin. Usually any of your elders, you'd refer, him, refer to him as aunt or uncle, mm -hmm. which was kind of weird. That's just what they did in the work. And yeah. The, they used to call it the work, but then they changed it to the Fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as soon as Rulin took over because he was an accountant and he knew the importance of having that church status for tax purposes because before they were just kind of winging it. Interesting. Okay, I want to know a little bit more about your mindset, though, because you it doesn't seem like you didn't believe the FLDS principles, theology, doctrine, you were just kind of annoyed that you couldn't be a regular teenager and have a girlfriend. Meanwhile, Lydia is like, I don't want anything to do with that. And so I'm wondering if both of you still believed it and why maybe there was a discrepancy. We're hoping to talk to Lydia. So we'll see if she comes on and lets us sit on that perspective. But for you, did you still believe it? You just didn't like the way they were doing things? Both of us still believed it because we were taught from our youth that that was the true church of God. Right. That we were cho the chosen people. You know, we're going to redeem the redemption of Zion. And that there's just people that weren't able to to adhere to the commandments and would fall off the wayside. And that's, that's where I thought I was in that stage. Like I was just failing the temptations. Like my nephew, when he left one time, I asked him what was going on. He's like, dude, I can resist anything but temptation. That, that's our mindset then is we both believed, but we just felt like, hey, this is, you know, we, we love each other. We're living life per se. We were teenagers to me. I don't think I really had much, de too much depth and thought I was just living life. Okay. So you decide to get married. Yeah. So we decided to get married. So we, we went over to her dad's for dinner. And after dinner, then him and I stepped back into his office and he says, Chris, he says, 99% of these marriages don't work out. I'm like, so you're saying there's a chance. Oh, wait. <laughs> wait, so 99% of what the marriages who start with sin or something? 
Well, just kids getting married, you know, this young. And I would think pl- people choosing each other, just everything about that. Like there wasn't a good vibe about us getting married. And so I'm like, dude, I got this. I love your daughter. I'm, I'm here for the long haul. Oh, that's interesting because I thought it was actually pretty common for women in the FLDS to get married at that age. Yeah, but to an older, more mature person, somebody that had good standing with the Lord. Okay. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like her, some of her sisters married older men and some of them were placed. Got it. I just wanted everyone to kind of understand the, the way in which they go about putting people together for marriage because it's not a normal courtship situation, generally speaking. No. These girls are kind of approached and it has to go through a bunch of authority, people saying yes to the marriage and, okay, it's okay to buy God or whatever it is. And sometimes they're just assigned a husband or a wife and they meet on the wedding day. So it's really rare, and correct me if I'm wrong, for two people to actually be in love when they get married, Right. Correct. Yeah. And and I don't know how they feel when they go into that situation, but it is. It's just like people are anxious to be married and they're anxious for the prophet to tell them who that is. And once they tell them, it's just like, oh, hey, we're getting married today. Whoa. It's crazy. Okay. So, but you're stoked to get married because obviously you love Lydia and you want to be led back into the fold because at this point, since you are not breaking any rules, you're kind of in the good graces because now you can have sex and all of that, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, it's going to be awesome. So we're getting <laughs> married. So, awesome. um, <laughs> right. So we, my sister came from Colorado City up to Salt Lake and they started sewing Lydia a dress. And my mom's like, Hey, we need to get you a new suit. And then she tells Lydia, we need to get, get her some new lingerie. And I'm like, Yeah, dude, this would be great. <laughs> wow. And so we go over to JC Penny. Lydia's over there with her, um, sister and they're like going through all this beautiful lingerie. It's all sexy. And they come over to where my mom is and she's just like, what is that? She's like losing her, <laughs> losing her mind. And Lydia's like, we said get lingerie. And she's like, no, dear, I meant like a slip. And <laughs> right. so crush those dreams. I was going to say, I'm really surprised that they're promoting lingerie because, again, for those who don't know, the FLDS dress is very, very conservative. We got to the wrists, very high neckline, down to the ankles. It, it's like a little prairie dress. We've shown pictures and maybe I'll show one now. But it's very, very conservative. And so I'm just assuming that you have to continue that conservative dress even through marriage because you also have the garments underneath, the Mormon garments, right? Well, and something so I don't forget about that is, is I started getting some of the priesthood training as when I came back because I'd get just like two or three hour interviews with Rule and Jeff. So I'd just sit in his office, he'd take phone calls, would read scripture, but receiving the priesthood training, then back when we were growing up, you didn't have to wear the long underwear or the temple garments. And the temple garments that we wore were based off of the old pattern. The only thing we were allowed to change is we could do snaps instead of the buttons. Like back in Joseph Smith's time, they had buttons that they would do, but we had the trap door and all that stuff. And so as I started getting into the higher teachings with Rulon. And I say Rulon just to be kind of disrespectful. We used to call him Uncle Rulon. But um, <laughs> so talking with, <laughs> talking with him, then he was telling me that you should never see your wife outside of her underwear. If you have any marriage relations, it should be with the long underwear on. How, how, hold on. How is that possible? <laughs> yeah, because the trap door, I guess. <laughs> Wait, the women had that too? Like a little flap? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, how thing. interesting. Oh, that sucks. And so she would like when we'd go to church on Sunday, then when she had put on her tights or nylons, yeah. then, you know, she'd have to line up the seam of the long underwear right in the back. And then as she pulled them up, she'd have to line it all up so it wasn't all wrinkly underneath there. She'd wear the long underwear. Wait, but she could wear the tights underneath the garments. The tights were on top of the garments. So if you had like no. nylons, <laughs> then yeah, yeah, it's a trip. Oh, <laughs> so they wow. have on these layers of clothes. Prairie style. So what changed for you? Like, so when you get married, do you have this kind of reignition of faith or do you double down on it? Do you, are you still pretty much just like, yeah, we're going through the motions because we like it here. What's your mindset? Man, that's a great question because, you know, we could only be sealed at first or not sealed, but um, just get a temporal marriage from the law of the land. And so my sister had left a long time before that. 
And so her LDS bishop came over and married us in our home there in Sandy. And so then now we're among the people. I'm starting to change my mindset of, of just playing around partying to let's build up our future. Let's start getting our car paid off. Let's build a house. And so, man, it was just beautiful. We were up there in Salt Lake and, and I was there for a year before I moved down to Colorado City to start working in our house. And I actually moved down there four months before my wife. And just the whole mindset had changed. All the kids that partied and things in town that I knew them and they would ask me, hey, do you want to go out and party? And I just had no desire anymore. I just loved the teachings they were giving us and the principles of the gospel. Like it seemed so wholesome. Mm. You know, when we got down to Colorado City, they had a dance once a month that we would do like these ballroom type dances with the whole community. And it was just beautiful. They'd put on these programs for the celebrations and they would just have amazing food and the community would come out and it would be all free and people were so happy and the friendship was just tight. Yeah. And it's kind of funny talking about that point. Then it reminds me when I first moved down, because when I was a kid, before I had left with my girlfriend or wife and even say Lydia, that sounds better when I left with Lydia, then um, I was in the grocery store at an Albertsons, like by the foothills. And I saw some of our people, but I was with some of my Gentile friends that had short sleeves and things. I might've been wearing short sleeves. I can't remember, but I'm like, Hey, I'm going to go say hi. Cause I just loved our people. And so I go up to this guy and he had a couple of ladies with him. I don't know if it was his daughter and wife or a couple of ladies. I don't know, but I'm like, Hey, I'm Chris Weiler. And he looks at me and he looks at my friends and then he turned away. And I'm like, Holy cow. It's so embarrassing. I don't know if I want to do that again. Yeah. And so now I moved down to Colorado city and my brother's introduced me to some different people in the hardware store. And I come up to this one guy. I'm like, Hey, I'm Chris Weiler. And I shake his hand and he holds onto my hand. He's like, did I see you at an Albertsons? You're like, no. Nope. Like, yeah. <laughs> No, I'm like, that was me. And he's like, dude, I am so sorry. He said, I thought somebody was pulling a prank on me. Like, I didn't know what to do. Oh. And so, yeah, it was just, it was great to get among the community. And then as Warren, you know, I just, as we got down there and I saw these beautiful families, then I'm just thinking, man, I can't wait to raise a family here. And then I'm telling my wife, I'm like, that's what I want. I want like 40 kids. She's like, settle down. <laughs> Maybe one every... Maybe one every two years, you know, we don't need to have, we don't need to overdo this thing. Yeah. And so, yeah, it was just, just amazing. We moved down into a camp trailer that didn't have any utilities hooked up and it was parked outside of my sister's house and she had um, three bedrooms and one and a half bathrooms and she had her whole family. I can't remember if she had six kids and her and her husband and then I was there sharing it. And then when my parents sold their house and they moved in, and so we had like 26 people in this house oh my gosh. that we're living in. So we lived there for a couple months while we we're building our other house. And finally, my dad's like, yeah, we got to move because it was just getting too much tension. And so we, um, it was just, the house was just framed. So we threw some drywall around one of the bathrooms. We had a wood burning stove that heated the water. And then we just hung a blanket up over the door in the bathroom. And we set up a temporary kitchen in the basement while we built the house. And it was some of the best memories uh, you know, in my life building that thing, like we, we wired it, we did everything on the home. And so when we'd get a light working, like the whole family would come over and they were just so excited to see progress. Wow. So it was really cool. We built this house. And that's, that's actually part of the story is because we built this house. My dad ends up dying in 96 in an airplane mm -hmm. accident. I was 18 at the time. And so, um, after that, then my mom was single for four years and then she moved out of the home. So I ended up with the home that we had built. And um, in 2004, and maybe we'll talk a little bit more about what happened before it led up to Warren Jeffs actually kind of taken, taken over when Ruland died. And they started purifying the people. In 2002, before the Winter Olympics, then Ruland told all the priesthood people that they all needed to move down to Colorado City, Arizona. And if anybody was left in the Salt Lake Valley after a certain point by the Olympics time, then they would no longer hold priesthood. So all the people sold all their houses up there and they moved down to Colorado City. Like people would just move in with other families. It was horrible for those guys that moved down. Like their privacy, their businesses, everything just totally shifted in their life. Yeah. Well, so they moved down. Warren takes over. Or Ruland dies. So I think he died in 2002. I can't remember because I remember 2003, Warren had taken over and Arizona was changing some law that was going to affect the polygamous people. 
And Warren got up and talked in meeting about it. And he said that this is an infringement on priesthood. And he says, we will not comply. And it seemed like it was shortly after that that he went into hiding and we didn't see him anymore. He quit coming to meetings. And so they were just conducted by the other brethren. And so early 2004, then um, we were coming into meeting and I had four kids at the time. And I usually like to get there just a little bit before it starts and try to find some seat up close to the front and sneak in. And so we kind of found one that was up front angled looking up to the podium. And um, so we get situated in there because there was only four seats. We had two kids on the ground and I looked up and it was only our prophet on the stand. And we hadn't seen him for, I don't know if it was a year. And all the other brethren that were usually up there were down in the audience. And so I remember sitting there just just praying that I would be worthy to receive whatever the Lord had for us. And so Warren gets up, he conducts a song, he says the prayer, and then he opens up his notes. And he, as he starts reading it, it's a revelation from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to his servant Warren S. Jeffs, such and such date. So it was almost like verbatim of the Doctrine and Covenants beginning. And then the verbiage of the revelation was very, very similar. And so I don't remember a whole lot about it. Pers- like details, and I don't remember exactly how many men he had stand up, but he called out like 28 men's names and had them stand up. And the Lord said that he's lost confidence in these men and that they need to repent from a distance immediately. And so, and that they wouldn't be able to come back unless they wrote confession letters that matched what the Lord had revealed to his servant Warren. Jeez. I, I was just feeling so heavy. Like we're already four years into potentially the seventh period of time. Like our, the second coming of our Savior is supposed to happen around the seventh period of time. And according to our reckoning, that's supposed to be around the year 2000. And so, you know, we're already on borrowed time. Like we don't know when this is going to happen. And so that's how the whole people felt. And so the Lord's serious about our preparation on asking these men to leave. And so we leave that thing. And I'm feeling super solemn. And as we get out in the end of the hallway to start leaving, because usually like our ward or our church, would typically house like 3,600 people every weekend. Mm -hmm. And so there's a ton of people as we're leaving, but as we're going out, I just see women sobbing. And some of the men that were called out, one was my stepdad, my brother-in-law, a bunch of my friends. Like I knew all these guys that were getting kicked out. The mayor was one of them. And um, one of his other brothers, it was just really prominent. Like they had eight or nine wives, 60 kids that were just super faithful. They just seemed like solid dudes. And now they're kicked out. So I remember going home to my family and I had my four kids there and my wife. And I said, hey, if the Lord finds me unworthy, then I want you guys to stay faithful and I'll do my best to get back in the Lord's confidence. Jeez. So I want to talk about this for a little bit because for those who aren't aware also, Mormon is in Mormonism, they believe that they have one true prophet who receives revelation directly from God and that's what makes them special and that's what makes their religion stand out among the others, right? So among these breakoffs, or if you are the original church, they each have their own prophet. If you are believing that uh, Warren is speaking directly to God and saying you are unworthy, that's a huge deal. And so what I want to know, because we know, or at least I personally believe that he's not talking to God, he's just on a power trip. What do you think was the purpose for him to kick out all of these men from the community who already had wives and children? I really don't know. I, After being gone now 12 years, I just think the guy was crazy. Like it was so random and sporadic, the people he would kick out. And it was just weird, the mind games that he could play with people. And hopefully we'll pick up on some of those stories as we go get going. And I remember in school, him teaching us in seminary, of how he says, I fully acknowledge that we are indoctrinating you children, but we're indoctrinating you in righteousness. Oh, that's one of my, <laughs> oh, so I hate that. This they is, call it out. Know, right? So they, it's like right in front of your face. They literally tell you, we are indoctrinating you, but they twist it in a way so you go, okay. So then if someone from the outside goes, you're being indoctrinated, they're like, I know, and it's great. And they have a way exactly. of just hiding in plain sight. So you don't see it. You don't connect the dots. You don't realize it's not a good thing. And it's just so aggravating. Well, it's so true. And, and like when we left the FLDS, then I, I thought that, uh, and I used to think, I used to say when we came out, but then I found out that meant something else, <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which is fine. If I, if I came out, I'd let you know. <laughs> yeah. 
But so when we left, then um, you know, I used to think we were we were like the weird people. Back to like this destruction, the mindset. I want to step back to a story when I was in fourth grade. Then I remember Warren teaching us. He's reading us all the scriptures of um, just all the destructions that have to take place that Joseph Smith had revelation on. You know, the, there's going to be blood flowing down the streets in the Salt Lake Valley. Um, the mothers are going to turn against the daughters. The fathers are going to turn against the sons. The real is going to, the moon's going to, or the earth's going to reel to and fro like a drunken man. The moon's going to turn to blood. Just all these horrible destructions he's reading to us in um, seminary. And then he says, children, we only have a short amount of time till the seventh period of time. He says, we've got a haste in our preparation. All this has to take place until then. And so I remember in fourth grade just sitting there thinking, I'm like, man, I really don't care what happens. Just just as long as I get my driver's license, then (laughs) it can all end after that. So I figured every day since then's just been a bonus. Yeah, that's terrifying for a child. Serious, and our whole life's been that way. And it's kind of funny because, you know, when I was talking to Rulin Jeffs when I was 18, and he says, do you know that your father doesn't hold priesthood? I'm like, no. And, and come to find out that he didn't believe in it. And my mom told him in, in order for them to stay together that he had to just go along with it. And so she raised us in that, but my dad didn't believe. Oh, And so interesting. he never went to priesthood. I mean, I just didn't think anything of him, even when I was up to 18, you know what I mean? And so he told me that. And so that, during that time before my dad died, then I had different conversations with him. And he's like, you know what, Chris? They've been teaching that stuff since I was a little kid. Uh-huh, the end of, end of time stuff. Yeah, you don't need to worry about it, which I thought was just so unusual because my mindset was still, even though he said that, I'm like, ugh, dad, who? You're like, well, like, what if you're, you're wrong? You're talking, you're like a pasta, or, uh, you know, talking, you're inspired of the devil or whatever it is, you know, that kind of energy. Yeah. But so, um, you know, there's just that kind of energy when we left the church, like the destructions are just about here. Yeah. After he kicked out all those guys. And so I went home to my family, talked to them, and we're moving forward. And every Saturday, we had to work a full day unto the Lord. And so we'd meet at 730, we'd have prayer and scripture, and then they would assign us out to somebody's home and would go bless them and redo a tile floor because I did tile for a living. But I was doing one of those jobs on a Saturday. I was talking to one of a, a different tile setter friend of mine that were working together on that. I'm like, man, I'm really concerned I could lose my family. And he says, Chris, you and I don't have anything to worry about, man. We're doing what's right. You know, like, we don't need to worry about that. Two weeks later, he was gone. And it just so randomly, people started just losing their families. And then those men that were kicked out didn't come back. And, uh, yeah, I just remember by, by October of 2004, when my, um, my th- third son, so it's my third son was born, and I remember holding him as a baby, thinking I'd try to keep my family together. I didn't know what that looked like because Lydia and I, when we when we came back into the faith, and we, you know, we just came back full heartedly. Like we tried to really just apply all the teachings to our lives, and it felt wholesome. It felt like a good direction to raise our family, mm-hmm. good work ethics, good moral values, and and so I was like, man, I'm, I'm going to try to keep my family together. And through the whole time before they asked me to leave. From that time, Lydia and I never discussed our doubts with the faith, so I didn't know how she felt about it. And it was crazy, the thought process. And I'll tell you some of the stories of even some of the other elders that I thought were super solid, that they felt the same way. You know, to me, I chose my wife, and I wasn't as faithful as some of the other people. And so I felt like, why are they getting kicked out and not me? But it was so weird how it messed with your mind. Because, you know, you'd get a restricted phone call, and it was usually from the bishop's office. And so, you know, you'd just be like, man, is this it? And you'd answer it and it'd be, oh, you know, this is so-and-so at the bishop's office. There's a, you know, our prophet calls for every elder to read such and such scripture or else it'd be, there's a thousand dollar call for every elder to help pitch in to pay for the court battles or something like that. And it'd be like, whew, I didn't lose my family. And so kind of had that mindset at uh, 2000, the end of 2004. And so I was thinking, you know, some of the people that would apostatize, then they stayed in their home. And so my thought process was, if they ever asked me to leave, then I would try to stay in my home. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't necessarily want to steal from the priesthood. If they ever wanted me to leave, I would do that. But we need to come to some agreements. Like I, 
I'll, I'll pay for the materials for a new house, but you guys need to provide the labor if you want me to leave this home. You know, it needs to be somewhat on a fair. And even though that's not fair, but that's a little bit more reasonable than just leaving my home. But so I was working down in St. George in 2005. My wife calls me and she says, Hey, the bishop wants us to move, you know, to come home. And so I come home and they're like, yeah, you know, we have a bigger family that could stay in this home. It's funny. The bishop's office didn't call me. They talked to her. Yeah. But so I came home and there was like probably 15 girls in there boxing up our stuff. And I'm talking to the moving crew and they're like, yeah, well, we have a bigger family that could utilize this space better. And so we'd like you to move into a different home so they could have this. And when we were building our home, and then, uh, and it was a beautiful work of service. Like I loved it so much to be building a home for my family and my parents. And so we'd go to these awesome meetings and they'd teach us like, Hey, don't set your heart on earthly possessions. Like these homes here in this community, they are the priesthoods. And if they were ever to ask you to leave it, do it in a heartbeat. Mm. And so I remember as we started getting this home finished after working on it for like five years and most homes weren't finished out there. And so we're getting this home close to finish. It was on an acre at a basketball court, a garden. We had a sidewalk, a bunch of grass, a carport, three car garage. Like it was 5,300 square foot home, wow. two apartments in it. And so it's a beautiful home. And I remember walking the grounds this one beautiful evening in the yard finished. And I was thinking, how cool would it be to see another family enjoying this? Like, I would just love to do this again. I'll go, they can have this and I'll go build another home. And so I had that mindset throughout the time that I was there. And it was also kind of interesting to see different times that a family was in terrible conditions and the church would just give them a brand new home to help them to just get their life back together. And within like a year, it was just trash, like old cars out front, windows broken out. Mm. And it's just like, oh my gosh, you know, it's, you have to be careful just giving something to somebody, especially like if I work so hard to do it and then they don't appreciate it. It's like, ugh. I started to get a little bit more reservation with that. So now we're, we have the moving crew at my house. And, uh, and so I'm like, well, okay, well, you know, if we're moving, do you know where we're moving? We're like, well, they, we don't yet. We're just going to move you across the street. There's three bedrooms over there. That we'll put you in. Your brother's going to be in the main house. And once we get your house, we'll move you out. And we'll just put all your, all your possessions down in the basement in the living room. Oh. And so it's like, uh, okay. <laughs> And so I'm kind of getting this feeling that I'm about to go in there and just tell everybody, it's like, hey, y'all, there's been a mistake. Put everything down, get out, you know? And so I, I held my tongue and I kept talking with them. And then they, they said, okay, we, we, we know which house is going to be yours. And they went and took me down to it. And there's this acre of ground that a dude that had four wives and a load of kids that he just set up a temporary house. And then he started working on his house while he – why he had this temporary house. And so we got like these two modular hotel room things like Ben was talking about. Yeah. So we got the two modular hotel room things. And then he built a, a dining room and laundry between that. And then it was a 14 by 70 trailer that was hooked to it. And so after they built him a house and the community went in there and we put pillars up, we put a roof over it, we stuccoed it. And then we remodeled this, this house. So it was kind of decent. But I remember working on it with my um one of my em employees i'm like man i would hate to live at this house oh no so now here it is like <laughs> here it is two years later and they're telling me this is where i'm gonna move to yeah and i'm just like oh my gosh like what should i do here and so we, they took us over and we met the family that was living there and we walked through it and we go back into the trailer master bedroom it has the old fiberglass big tub in there and the shower's leaking and you know, we'd put in, I don't think there was anything I kept as far as kind of the finishes. There were some cabinets that were good. But I'm in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, we can make this work. I'll redo all the tile showers, put in granite tops. We'll retile the house. And then we finished the backyard, put in a basketball court and things later. But I'm thinking we can do this. So we did the swap. We moved over to the three bedrooms. The guy's house that we were fixing up that was going to move out of mine. And I was super motivated to help get his done so they could move him out of ours. And we moved into our house, which was just awesome. And and once we moved into that house, my wife was actually like, you know what, this is a relief because I didn't realize that as much tension was building up because my brother moved in up above us. And just to have somebody living next to us like that was awful for my wife. And so it ended up just being a blessing to just get a different house. And so we lived in that other house for 10 years. 
once we left the faith, <clears throat> that I petitioned the state and got my other house back. Oh, wow. The first house that you built? Yeah. Yeah. It was really a cool moment to walk back in there after 10 years of being gone. Yeah. So I have to know because polygamy is considered the way to get to heaven. You're supposed to have three wives minimum to get to the highest level of Mormon heaven. And you only had one. So I'm wondering if you were thinking about polygamy, if it was on your mind at all. Right. And so that's something that people would ask me periodically because that was something that was a calling. It wasn't ever anything you were supposed to seek out. Oh. And so I always, I'd see different friends and people get called into that. And definitely my mind's curious, like, man, I wonder how that works. And then how would I handle that if, if that was ever asked of me? You know, like the only way I would ever want to be in a situation like that is if it was a blessing to Lydia. Like if she was somebody like Lydia and it just molded, then I could potentially see it my working. But I'm so grateful it never did because it just would have been aw awkward and awful, I think. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's interesting. But there's people that love to live it and, and I don't want to knock them. Like if, they, if it's lifestyle that people love and it could be beautiful. But like I, I, I listened to something, I can't remember if it was in Switzerland or one of those countries over there that they were talking on a podcast that they're actually setting up communal type living for single mothers. And so the mothers will have like a main hangout area where kids can all play together. They'll have a mother that will watch the kids. They'll have different meal times and they're getting like serious results from this, from these women living in a situation like that. And I'm like, that's funny because that's kind of like a polygamist house. <laughs> yeah, at least in the FLDS where the wives do live in the same home versus other sex like the order, for example, where they're all in their own separate homes. Which is a way smarter way to do it. But, you know, we were taught that you're not living true polygamy unless they're all in like the same kitchen. Yeah. Because, Oof. and some of the women I'd hear them say like, you know, and I know this is super difficult, but you know, we're, we're learning how to sacrifice and live the higher laws for heaven. And, and yeah, just kind of bizarre, like the whole, so many things that would happen would be bizarre. Like my stepdad, then he married, he was 80. I think he was definitely 80, maybe a little older, but he was given like his ninth or 10th wife. And she was still in high school. Ew, no, no, Chris. And so like, it's all, oh, okay, this is, this is mother so-and-so. And he also is what's a trip is so before my mom married my stepdad, then he had already married my niece. But since my parents had so many kids, then my niece was like six years older than I am. I'm like trying to work my way up the family tree. Like how did that <laughs> <laughs> that work? Well, well, it's so funny because my, my great nephew is my brother, right? And so he just, he just got married. He, he married a Gentile. Uh -huh. <laughs> and she's like, she's like so fascinated with it. I was talking to her mom and she's like, yeah, she sits down and uh, she has it all graphed out on the board. She can tell you how the family all works and who's who. And, and yeah. I think it's kind of hilarious, but it's totally ooh and it's awful, but it was just weird that that was happening. But so yeah. when my mom married, married into the family, then my niece already had several kids. And then this younger wife got married to him and then he got kicked out. And then all the women got married to a different guy. They just reassigned the block of women to someone else. Yeah, it wasn't the block. It was, they spread them out. Okay. Different men. And so, oh. yeah, it was just a tough time because this guy really seemed like a father figure to me and my wife. Every, every month before priesthood meeting, then all of us boys would get together and have a meeting at night. And then the next day, then they would have, they'd have three families of the, within the family that would, uh, put on a beautiful breakfast, coffee, which let's just talk about coffee okay, yeah, for a go second. For it. <laughs> so we were taught that the word of wisdom yeah. was of that. It wasn't, and never in there says anything about, oh, by way of commandment. It was uh -huh. just word of wisdom. Right. And so we were to partake wisely. Like if we felt like we needed coffee, we could have coffee. Or if we had a beer, we could have a beer, but just not doing it, not do it in excess. Yeah. <clears throat> Which is kind of funny. It reminds me of this story of this, this guy that would go into the bar and he would order three, three beers. And so he's sitting there sipping on all three of them until they're gone. And after the bartender sees him coming in doing this consistently, he's like, Hey, bud, how about I just watch? As soon as your beer starts getting low, I'll bring you a cold one. 
And the guy chuckles. He's like, no, I've got two other brothers around the nation. And um, at a certain time of the day, then we'll go have three beers so we can have a beer together. And the guy's like, that's rad. Like, how cool is that? You know? Uh-huh. And so after, after time of doing that, he comes in, he only orders two beers. And the, the bartender comes up after a bit and he's like, hey, man, I'm really sorry. And he says, what do you mean? He says, well, you told me about your brothers. Now you just ordered two. And he's like, oh, no. He says, I, I became a Mormon. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, it's so interesting about the word of wisdom. So I grew up in the mainstream Mormon church, if you haven't figured that out, guys. But we weren't allowed to drink alcohol, no coffee, no tea. And it was all because of this word of wisdom put into place by Joseph Smith. And so many times and we all would just get super annoyed and be like yeah but he had joseph smith had distilleries and they drink wine and like why are we being so strict uh, strict about this and what i was told this may not be factually correct but from what i was told they doubled down on it during prohibition time and kind of said see our prophet you know he was ahead of his time and we're not supposed to consume it at all and then it was legalized again and then they're like you can't consume it at all. And they just didn't flip back. That could be wrong, but that's what I heard because it really isn't even specific about coffee or tea. It just says hot drinks. And they're like, well, we interpret that to be coffee and tea. And I'm like, what about hot chocolate? And they're like, totally fine. But why can't you drink coffee or tea? Well, because of the caffeine. Well, hot chocolate has caffeine. Radio silence. It just, none of it made any sense and we all hated it. (laughs) It doesn't. So it's funny that you were like, no, we're going to do it the way Joseph Smith did. (laughs) It was, yeah, it was great. So we'd have these beautiful breakfasts and it just felt so good to be a part of that family. When he got kicked out, like it was devastating to us and especially to my wife because her dad left um, and I think it was around 98. And so she didn't have a dad and this guy just really filled that space. He was so good to us. And um, after he got kicked out, then we were, my mom had been remarried by this time now, and we were out on a bike ride with a new family, and we got the call that he had passed away. Mm. And, uh, you know, Lydia just started crying. It was, it was a, just a tough time, especially with everything that was going on. Yeah. <clears throat> but, yeah, it was, it was cool being a part of that family. So I have to get your perspective, especially since we haven't had a married couple's perspective before, on just the inner workings of husband and wife and are you allowed to use birth control or are there restrictions around intimacy or what are the expectations for having multiple children? Yeah, and so we're supposed to um, replenish and populate the earth. And so it's kind of based on how we want to do that. And I never really used birth control. And so I don't really know if they talked much about using birth control in meeting or anything like that. But I think it was kind of a given that you wouldn't. But it was our last child was a surprise. And so I got in big trouble for that by my wife. Like she was so pissed. <laughs> so we're at Costco. <clears throat> we're at Costco and I buy a box of condoms. And so we're like this plague family going through there. And I put them up there to check them out. And it was just so funny, the cashier's response to it. Because she can see we're FLDS and then she sees this box of condoms and she looks back at us and then she scans them and it was hilarious. Because <laughs> you had seven children total. Yes, I have seven kids. And yeah. it was just so cool. Like my, my youngest daughter is just such a go-getter. Like you understand how she just forced her way down here. But um, we're so glad we got her. But she, I don't think if it wouldn't have happened that way, we wouldn't have her. And so I'm so glad it did. Yeah. So... I was told from Ben in our last interview that there were these top secret documents given to married people about how you're supposed to please each other and like the requirements around sex. And I think it's just so interesting. Are you willing to talk about it? (laughs) Yeah. So if I would have been around or had those documents, then I, I would I would be able to speak on it because like you watch Preaching Evil. And it talks about Warren when they went to Texas, how he had those revelations on how you're supposed to please your husband Uh and then come to find out that he would actually have, um, what the heck did they call him? Because Ben talked about it, heavenly sessions Yeah. when all the women would come in and just please Warren. And they, some of the, some of the wives talked about that and that's stuff we didn't know about. Okay. You know, like the crazy, crazy stuff. We didn't know about that. As far as I was concerned, Warren was a good guy. Once we left and I started to find out who he really was, then um, 
Yeah, it was just, it was perfect the way we laughed. Because a lot of times when people laughed, then they felt like they were turning against God. Yeah. And then they would get into drugs, alcohol, infidelity, things that would just take their life in a direction that you could just see the, the unhappiness. And they would teach us that if you ever left the faith, then you would never have a moment of peace again. Like you'd always be buffeted by Satan. And so, you know, we believed if we left, then that's how you would feel. And it was kind of wild. One thing I thought was interesting, because I, a lot of times I'll just wake up at two or three in the morning and I feel like I'm ready to go. And so I would just get out and work on my books or start working on organizing my tools or something like that. And so in church, though, one time they had talked to us about if you don't sleep very well at night, it's because you don't have enough of the Spirit of God. And so I was feeling pretty bad about it. And I was talking to one of my employees about it one time. And he says, he says, that, he, he said, that must be true. He says, because when I'm in church, he says, I sleep really well. <laughs> <laughs> just feeling the Spirit. <laughs> So I wanted to get into why you left or like that meeting. We talked about it off camera because it had a little bit to do with the whole chastity thing or purity thing, even within marriage. Yeah. And let's get to that. And one thing on the marriage that I don't think I mer <clears throat> mentioned when all the way, because we're, you know, we're not supposed to have any, we're not ever supposed to see our wife outside of her underwear. Like that's as close as much as she can go down to. And then also they were saying, that if you have real lustful desires when you're making a child, then you're actually intensifying those feelings that, um, that they'll feel as they grow up. And so whenever you're like trying to make a baby, you should be thinking of the prophet or the Lord. Oh, no. What? <laughs> I know. I know. No. I'm like, I don't know how this works. <laughs> Warren, you, but, you sneaky guy, you. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> hang a picture up over here. And, Ooh. No, yeah, just gross, right? But it, it was funny. I, it's funny to me now, like we talk about it. But um, back to us. So now we're going through the period of time that they've kicked these guys out. Warren's just randomly kicking people out. And it was just so like stressful to think that you're going to lose your family. Like some of the thoughts that would go through my mind, like if I was ever asked to leave, I mean, what, what family would I want my family to go to? Oh, wow. And just weird thoughts like that. And one day we went over to my sister-in-law's for lunch <clears throat> and we're making lunch and having a nice conversation. And she's like, oh, did you hear so-and-so law or was corrected? That's what they called it. Did you hear so-and-so was corrected? And that just meant they lost their faith. They lost their family. They lost their job. They're to repent from a distance and not have anything to do with the priesthood people unless they work their way back. And it was just devastating. Like we didn't have anything to do with these guys that left. So I didn't hear their stories till later, but it just tore them up like to lose their family and they would just go work like 18 hour days trying to stay sane they would send all their money back home just with letters like please i pray the lord will forgive me like whatever i did i'm sorry type thing and it was just wild to hear their stories but i didn't go through that i stayed in there yeah and you know in 2005 i thought i just need to start getting ready so i stopped paying tithing i started to make sure my credit was really good i'd still work every saturday for free just so I wouldn't burn in hell. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I bought property. I started just getting ready in case they asked me to leave. And it was almost in my mind a matter of when, not if. Mm. It was a matter of when. I just wanted to be ready. But I, Lydia and I never talked about that. And so there was a bunch of stuff that happened in between there. Like um, Warren sent a revelation that we had to have this house built by the end of 2010. And so the people were just going mad on trying to get it done. And they set up, um, I think it was like a 14 foot wall around the city block and put plastic up so you couldn't get in, couldn't see inside. And then they put, um, a, another internal section that was fenced off that you couldn't go in there unless you were specially ordained for that. Was this a house for Warren? Yes. Come to find out, like I was talking to somebody that was interpreting the revelations and drawing the pieces of property. <clears throat> then the Lord would say, well, I want this and this and different things that wanted to happen. But then he's trying to mathematically make it fit on this plot of land. And it's like, well, maybe the Lord didn't quite know how big this house is and where <laughs> it's supposed God. to fit. Like, <laughs> what did the Lord really mean here? You know? Oh, uh, different conversion in heaven, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, I don't know. Like, that's what he says. He's like, this isn't making a bit of sense. But so then there's this guy, Richard Holm, that lost his family. 
And um, he was fighting against the priesthood, trying to get his house back, trying to bring awareness to people of how bad these guys were. And so I remember him getting up on the hill above that space, looking down in it, taking pictures. And I remember thinking, man, dude, just leave. If you don't like this place, just leave. Don't sit here and fight against the priesthood. And mm -hmm. you have to remember Richard Holm because that's a part of the story. When my daughter got caught with her boyfriend, they'll refer to old Richard Holm. So I'll tell that, but just think about that. Okay. Well, so now we're working inside this property and um, I'm in there helping on the footings on this big house. And it was kind of funny. One of the guys, his name was, but he comes in there and there was two other people with him. And he's just like, hello, everyone. Good to see you shaking hands. And, and I'm like, man, he's acting so weird. And come to find out that he had got called into the, um, to be a first counselor to the bishopric. I thought it was so funny to see the, the uh, change in his demeanor just because now he's right. like one of the boys. So then I was working in California at the time when that was going on. So I didn't work a ton on the house on that one, but it was crazy. Like the Lord didn't cooperate with us very good. He was sending uh -huh. rain and snow and ice and the people were just bleeding, trying to meet this date that the Lord had given them. Oh, no. So it was just this intensity, this intensity that was going on for eight years until the end of 2011. <clears throat> then Warren Jeff sent a revelation from prison that said the only people that could remain in the church were those that qualified for the Holy United Order. And that Lyle Jeffs and his two counselors were to judge the Short Creek Stake of Zion. Okay. So what does that mean in layman's terms? So Colorado City, like the pioneers used to call it Short Creek. And so Short Creek is where we lived. And that in order for us to stay in the church, the Lyle Jeffs had to give us the recommend to move forward. He's the one that was kind of in charge at the time, Lyle, because yeah. Warren is in prison. Correct. And Lyle's his younger brother from the same mother. Okay. And um, so now it's like, wow, this is a big deal because the United Order, you have to give all your earthly possessions to the church. And in my mind, as I started to think about it at that time, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm okay with giving all my earthly possessions, but we need to sit down and get some rules established. Like if I give you all my earthly possessions, you're going to answer your damn phone when I call. <laughs> and you're going to make sure my family's taken care of. You know what I mean? None of this. Yeah. We're in hiding and can't take care of you. So that, those are some of my thoughts as we were going into that. And so they called, they, as we went, I don't know if they called a special meeting, but we were just in church and they were teaching us how sacred this covenant was. And they talked about back in St. Peter's time of when they were establishing the United Order and that there was a husband and wife that wanted to enter into it. But they talked amongst themselves and thought, well, let's hold back a portion just in case this fails, we'll have something to fall back onto. And so they go into their interview and the husband went in before the wife. And the first thing that um, or they asked the husband, are you giving your all? And he said, yes. And because he had lied, then God killed him. And so they drug him out. And now the uh, wife comes in and they ask her, are you giving your all? And she said, yes. And he said, you'll go the way of your husband. And God killed her. And so they took her out. And they said, brothers and sisters, this covenant we're about to enter into is so sacred that it cannot be broken without dire consequences. And so they were starting to prepare us for, for this sacred covenant. And so in preparing that, you know, they taught us things there. But in, in between this time before my interview, then they called a special priesthood meeting. And so in this meeting, then it's just the priesthood bearers. So 12 year old boys or older that had received, um, one of the priesthoods were there and we'd just go meet into the congregation wherever we could fit in. And so we had prayer, song, and then some scripture. And they called for the lower priesthoods to go to their classes. They separated out of there. So all of us men, elders moved forward. I ended up about 11 rows back, which is really close. So I could see really well. We had some more teachings and it seemed really positive and it's now come to a close. The boys are coming back into their seats and it's not quite time to close. And I see Lyle get up to the pulpit and he adjusts the mic down and he leans onto the pulpit and he says, brethren, he says, if you don't make it into the United Order, you'll lose priesthood. And he says, without priesthood, your marriage covenant will be invalid. And he says, anything more than a handshake with your wife? will be adultery. So hasten, brethren, hasten. 
And I'm just like, oh my gosh, I don't want to be guilty dramatic. of adultery. Like this is so intense. Like what do I do as this is building up now to my interview? And so I'd bought some property just outside of town, out in Cane Beds. It's on the way out to Coral Pink Sand Dunes. Then I was building a spec house out there. And um, I was talking to my electrician out by out in front of the house. And this dude solid has two wives, 12 kids, just seems like an awesome guy to me. And um, I get a restricted phone call. And, you know, for eight years, it's always been like, whoa, is this it? And so I answered. And they said they were with the bishop's office and that I could come into my interview. And so I said, yeah, I'll be right there. And so I hung up and I told um, this electrician, I told him I'm going into my interview. And he just went, he got really solemn. He's like, man, he says, I'm really concerned I could lose my family. And I didn't want to get into his personal business, but he just kept talking. He says, um, you know, he says, sometimes I enjoy going to a restaurant and watching a ball game. Because that's not allowed. So two things we aren't supposed to yeah. do. Yeah, sports, that's idolatry. That's worshiping man over God. And if we ever eat out, we're supposed to do takeout. We're not supposed to sit down in a restaurant. And so because of that, he feels like he's going to lose his family. Wow. And so I asked him, I says, well, if they were ever to ask you to leave, I said, would you try to keep your family together? And he said, no way. He says, I don't want innocent blood on my skirt. And it just goes to show how everybody was um, was just so worried. Like he had everybody on edge that they're going to lose their family. And also just for just simple things like that, like you're going to leave your kids there to the priesthood so you don't corrupt them by watching movies or a ball game or I mean going to a restaurant and and uh watching a ball game like it just was it just set inside like wow that's wild that everybody's worried about this and so now I go into the meeting house to go into my interview there's three levels of security you have to get past to get in there and so now it's my turn to go in and see Lyle and as I walk into the room then there's a couch to the right and there's a scribe and counselor there and there's a couch to the left that had a counselor and then Lyle was behind an executive desk. So I shake everybody's hand and we sit down and Lyle said, there's two questions that I need to make sure you understand before we get started. He says, one of them is clean and pure thoughts. He says, thoughts don't originate from within. They come from without. And so you've got to decide whether it's good or evil. And he said, father, meaning Rill and Jeff's said that if it's evil, that you typically have a three second rule that you've got to get it out get that thought out of your mind within three seconds or you're thinking evil. Do you understand? And I said, yes. And the next was, was the law of purity. He said that, um, it's a new revelation that Warren had sent from prison, that there's to be no marital relations between husband and wife, unless you know your wife can conceive. And he said, there's no practice sessions. Do you understand? And I said, yes. And then we got started with our interview and he was asking me questions that seemed um, quite positive. Or I, sorry, he was asking me questions that I was answering positive to. But then he came to the question, do you seek Gentile entertainment? And they, they were teaching us that in these last days, there's no free time for frivolous things. No more hunting, hiking, fishing, or sports. If we have any free, free time, we need to be building up the kingdom of God or blessing our family or our neighbor. And so my answer to that question, do you seek Gentile entertainment, was if going on a hike or something like that with my family, if that's Gentile entertainment, then I definitely seek Gentile entertainment. Mm -hmm. And so he went to the next question and he said, do you, do you um, only think clean and pure thoughts? And I says, I can't answer that 100% yes. I says, but I always strive to. And he took some, wrote something down and put his pen down. He says, last question. Or you live in the law of purity. And this is not the way you're describing it. Yeah. And he says, okay. We shook hands. That was the end of the interview. I shook hands with the securities. I left and I just felt like, you know, it's okay. Whatever happens, I know that I'm, I feel good inside. And I just went back to life. You know, I tried to always not get too deep into the scriptures and things like people would be like, well, this isn't right because this or so and so. I wasn't that type of person. I'm like, man, just tell me how to be good and I'll do my best to make that happen. Mm -hmm. And so I just went back to life about that. And so it was like three days later and this is winter time. It's 1030 at night. I'm in my pajamas and I'm doing an estimate that had to be done on my computer. And then my phone rings 
and it's restricted. And I'm like, man, is this it? And I answered it. And he said, hello, this is Ray B. Allred with the bishop's office. He said, I wanted to first start out by saying this is an act of love. He says, you're no longer a member of the church. You no longer hold priesthood. You no longer have a marriage covenant. You're to remain in your home and be a steward over your family. You can no longer come to general meetings, but you can come to these 11 o'clock non-member meetings. Do you have any questions? And I'm just thinking in my mind, like, wow, this is happening. Like, uh, I'm so surprised he didn't ask me to leave. Yeah. And, and then, um, like, does this mean I need to move into a separate room than my wife? And so that's why I asked him because I'd been working on Saturday projects and some men were finishing rooms so that they could be separate from their family. And so I asked him if that's what I should do. And he says, I would. He says, you might get aroused. Yeah, because it's your wife who you have seven children with. Hello? (laughs) (laughs) What? Totally, right? Like, it's so obvious. And it was such a funny, (laughs) such a funny way that he responded to that. And I says, well, what about a civil marriage? And he's like, sure. You like you're the way he said it was like, you're going to throw away eternity for these few seconds on earth. Sure. Like. And I says, well, what if I already have one? And then he's like, I don't know. He says, I'm just a messenger boy. And I says, yeah, thank you for calling and told, told him bye. And it was just like, wow, this just happened. And so I went outside on the trampoline, looked at the stars and laid in the cold. And then I came back into bed and I stayed on my side of the bed. And then the next day I told my wife what they'd said. She's like, Really? And the way she said it, I didn't know if that meant that she would go with me or not. And so then that night I sat down and talked with her and I says, darling, I says, I don't feel like I could be happy going forward with what they're, what they're asking me to do. I says, I feel like it'd be best for me to live my life the best I can. I says, I don't know what that looks like. I says, but I want you to be a part of it. And I says, I want to support you in whatever you choose. Like if you feel like your salvation's here, your family, I, I understand. And without even hesitating, she just says, I just want to be together as a family. Mm -hmm. And then she looked down and she looked back up at me. And she says, do you think we can be happy outside of the church? I'm like, I don't know. Gave her a hug and then we just started to transition. And and my joke that I say at that point is here we are 12 years later just trying to live positive and show people there's life after Jeff's. Yeah. (laughs) Because in (laughs) in the Mormon faith, we're taught that there's life after death. Yeah. That was life after Jeff's. Ha ha. <laughs> but so, yeah, we just started to, you know, we, we'd keep going out and hiking with the kids. We'd go out on rollerblades or bikes with them. And so people could see that we weren't complying. And so the first people to cut us off was our family. Mm. Changed their phone numbers, quit talking to us. And then eventually it was all the people. And this is where I was getting to where it really helped us to transition the way we did instead of just leaving because we felt like we were disobeying God and we couldn't be good people because of wrong things that we were doing. And I say wrong, it's relative, but because of things that we were doing, like we left in that situation that we did, there was, there was a lot of people who were in that same situation. So it gave us a little bit of a circle that we could relate to them a little bit. We still never connected with them, but we would see some people that had left as well. <clears throat> so that gave us some, some condolences maybe. Mm-hmm. That we're, it's okay. And then we started to find out or hear things from some of Warren's family that had left, some of the internal operations that were going on, and things that he were do- was doing in prison. And so we just sat down with the kids after we learned some of those things, and we said, hey, we need to stop praying for Warren. We, we didn't realize that he was the man that he is. Whoa, that's a huge deal. I have to stop there because, especially in this interview, and maybe I can put some on the screen, but... You guys are just 100% for Warren, and, and I get it, and especially with everything we've talked about. It makes sense. You were <clears throat> taught to see him as a prophet of God, and he can do no wrong, and he probably isn't doing anything wrong because look at him. He's such a great guy. And then when you realize that all of this stuff is true and that he is in prison because he should be in prison, how did you take that? Did it feel like everything came crumbling down or did it feel like, well, maybe just this prophet is led astray and LDS is still away? What's going on in your mind? That's a really good question because transitioning from it, then I, I loved what the church had done for us 
you know, without that, I wouldn't have the marriage that I have, the kids that I have. And so I was so grateful for the structure that it gave us in our lives. And I hadn't lost my testimony at that point. And so I was just wondering, where should we go? And so there was a group that had um, left uh, in 84. And there was a, a Wayman gentleman that was on the show earlier that was part of that group. That They, they still go by the work. Mm-hmm. They kind of kept that traditional value. And they're beautiful people. But after going out there, I just didn't really feel like I wanted to join up with that. And so the um, LDS church started to come and visit us, a bishop from Moccasin Ward, because that was the closest ward. It was maybe 14 miles away from Colorado City. And they just seemed like really cool guys. But so we had a Mormon bishop and his assistant come see us. And I really enjoyed visiting with them. Uh, but Letty was just kind of offish. Like one time I saw him pulling away from my home when we were pulling up. So I was going to honk to see if they'd stay and, and come say hi or say hi to him. And Lydia grabs my hand so I couldn't honk. And she's like, no, like, <laughs> let's have some family time. And so she was kind of offish to some of those things. And so I was talking to some of my friends in St. George. And one of them um, had talked to the mission president in St. George. And they sent two sister missionaries out to um, come visit us. And Lydia really connected with them. And so they started giving us the teachings. They would come hang out with us on their days off. They'd help her in the garden. Like it just felt like community again. And so I wondered if that was the way we were going to go, if we are going to go to the LDS church. And um, in that process of them on their mission, they were just getting off of theirs. And a new set of sister missionaries were coming on when they were, when they were talking to us about baptism. And they gave us a lesson on baptism. And after that, they asked me if I was willing to be baptized. And I said, sure. I said, I'm not 100% converted, but I'd be willing to be baptized. And they said, that's perfectly normal as you go forward in faith and your testimony is going to grow. They turned to her and asked her if she was willing to be baptized. And she's like, no, I'm not. And they said, well, why not? And she says, I just, I've been baptized three different times. I don't feel like I need to be baptized again. And then the missionary says, well, if you don't want to be baptized, why are you having us come? And so Lydia's like, yeah, exactly. No more. So I kind of x nade that. (laughs) So we we didn't join anything. And it's been fantastic. And it was kind of wild. Some of the, some different things that people shared to me and other insights that I've had that I just, I'm I'm pretty happy with just being who we are. Mm -hmm. I respect a lot of people with their faiths and, and the good that it brings them in their lives, but we're really happy to just not have that aspect. Like my wife just said, I don't need somebody to tell me whether I'm a good person, but I have to, I can't wear a tank top or I, or if I can't have a beard, like people would give me a hard time about that. Yeah. And so that, that's how it transitioned. I hope I answered your question enough that that's how we kind of transitioned where we are and where we're just living positive. We love it. Yeah. So where are you now? What are you doing? What are you up to? I know you've got some big things going on. And so I would love for everyone to hear how there is life after Jeff's. (laughs) So much. And and so I'll tell you about that. And I'd like to go back and tell you a little incident that happened two years after we left. But, um, you know, my father-in-law had left 14 years before us. And so when I, after we left and I told my wife, I'm like, hey, let's call your dad. And, you know, I say dad now, but it was father Mm -hmm. or mother or children. You wouldn't say mom or dad or kids. Like they had indoctrinated us into that. Like we used to say that when we were younger, but then they indoctrinated us into that's evil to say that. Like that is so disrespectful to say dad, it would have been father. And so it was interesting to start to transition from that or to grow out facial hair, wear short sleeves. Like it was just such a trip to go back to that lifestyle right. like it wasn't too long after we left that we went to cancun and lydia wore a bikini and it was just like oh my gosh <laughs> oh yeah it was it was kind of an interesting situation to transition from that but back to um kind of where we are now and how that transitioned so i i called my father-in-law my old girlfriend's number so i had it memorized and left a voice and Millie called back said yeah i would love to see you can come to sunday dinner so he lives about four hours away from us we drive up there. He hasn't seen us for 14 years. And as we pull up to the house, then dad's waiting out front. And as Lydia gets out of the truck and our kids start to get out, then she walks up towards him and he walked up towards her and he just came up and gave her a big hug and started to cry. 
and it was just so amazing mm-hmm. and to have have the family and friends and people that were just such a support to us as we were leaving that I just I'm so grateful yeah but with that said then he would come down and see us and he says I, I really recommend that you move out of Colorado City and so I started looking for some property and we went ended up finding 25 acres down by Sand Hollow um, State Park in southern Utah which is a great vacation spot and then I didn't have utilities down there so I got um, all that engineered and pushed through and and was able to get rezoning from the city and in doing so I worked with some of the neighboring properties so I ended up buying a hundred acres down here Wow but we got like 55 acres of a zoned resort which is awesome for this area. Like I was sitting in city council and they said they were really excited about 4 million people going to Zion, which is about 40 minutes from our property. Yeah. But they said they're like, they're getting about that many people here at Sand Hollow State Park. And I'm a mile away from that. And so we're putting in this epic resort and it's been so fun to just watch it evolve as we've moved forward in this. Cause we have a 12,000 square foot clubhouse. <clears throat> There's a game room in there that has two golf simulators, a pool table, a bunch of games. So you check in, you go through that area and you go out into the pool area. And then we have a surf machine. The adult section's five feet higher than the main pool. And so it water falls off into the main pool. So when you're hanging out up there and you don't want to be splashed and you can watch all the kids play yeah. while you're in there. <laughs> There's a big pool with a volleyball net in it. The lazy river kind of goes along the side of that pool. And around or it goes through a tunnel and then when it comes out, there's a 12,000 gallon tank that can dump every 40 seconds, I think it is. And there's another wave machine that comes around from that. We have a big kids play area that has eight water slides around it and a four lane racer that comes off. And then there's a 40 foot tower off of the rooftop that comes off of the two water slides that come off there. We have 7,000 square feet of rooftop deck with four hot tubs up there, some pergolas. There's a barbecue place up there, you know, if you want to cook your own food. We have a commercial kitchen and outdoor bar that's over by the surf machine. And there's 2,000 square feet of event space. Jeez. So, yeah, I hope that wasn't like too much detail, <laughs> but it's been so much fun. Like we left 12 years ago with nothing. Yeah. And to see this community grow. And I've already built out 60 lots and we're the exclusive builder in here now. And then we're just dreaming up this resort. And it's so fun to just see people give us ideas and then we do it. And people come in here and they think that I'm a genius. And I'm like, no, I'm just taking ideas from other people. Like, it's not me. Wow. But it's really cool. So we have a detention basin that's in a really cool spot that we're turning into a city park. And then we have a rec center that we're putting in next to the city park. It's 90,000 square feet. And so the main floor has 18 foot ceilings. So we're looking at putting in 12 indoor pickleball courts. We have two racquetball courts. And then we'll have a kid's playground area. That ties in above the, there's a 30 foot wide corridor that goes between the pickleball courts that have tables and hangout areas down there. But then we'll do obstacle courses up above that so you can bring your kids, let them go play while you play pickleball or racquetball or volleyball or handball. So then the next floor we're going to put on, um, uh, it'll be a coffee shop. Definitely, right? Yeah. And then spa. <laughs> Obviously, naturally. <laughs> <laughs> Yoga studio and then a full gym. So that floor will be mainly just around health and fitness. You know, like a, the spa, I want to have, you know, steam room, sauna, cold plunge, just a lot of cool stuff in there. And then third floor, we're looking to have that be sort of some event space, high end parties. So we'll have a stage for live music. We'll have a dance floor. I want to have a really nice bar restaurant up there with axe throwing golf simulators. And then the view from that third floor is just going to be amazing. Jeez. And so that's what we've got so far. So that's just the first half of the resort. I still have another half that I haven't platted. And so we're kind of thinking of different concepts like, you know, we're definitely going to put in a uh, boat and trailer parking because there's so much outdoor stuff to do here that people bring their toys. So we'll need a place for that. And then I've got 50 acre feet of water. And so I'm hoping I can engineer a surf lake. Like down in Waco, they have this surf park that you have different chambers that you can fire them off. Yeah. And the way you fire them off will give you a type of wave that you can surf. So you'll paddle out there and surf. But that's what we're up to now. That is absolutely insane. You've got like Disneyland mixed with SeaWorld mixed with resort. It's like all of it rolled into one. And I want to go. So when is it going to be open? <laughs> I know, right? So June of next year, we'll have it open as far really? as the water Really? All of that is going to be nice done? Is, yeah, it's awesome. They're pouring concrete now, right now. We're about to start framing the clubhouse. And the first townhouse they're getting done. And we have the house next to mine. Like I live in one of the resort houses. 
But the house next to mine is 18 bedrooms. What? Has indoor trampoline, foam pit, rock climbing wall, theater, <laughs> game room, and pickleball court inside. And then outside it has two pools with uh, um, steam room and sauna. And so it's good. They're just really cool single family houses that are Airbnb. And then we have some neat townhouses. So the townhouses right now, are, they're five plexes. And so there are three bedroom units that are all connected together through the backyards. And so they're private backyards. And so there's private, private gates that can be open if you want to connect the units. So every backyard has a hot tub, a fire pit, sitting area, and a barbecue. But each unit sleeps 14 people. So just a fiveplex, you'll be able to sleep 70 people in that thing. So this is something that you can rent now that's available. Yep. Yeah, there's properties that are available to rent and the lake's open. So you have paddle boarding, snorkeling, scuba diving over there. There's rock jumping, and then you can boat. So there's surf, you know, uh, wake surfing, wake boarding. We love it. Like it's just so rad. It's from the lake to my parking lot, seven minutes. Oh my god! And they have a they have a huge outdoor space where you can ride sand dunes and, um, you know, they do jeep cr- rock crawling and stuff like that up there. I've I've been too broke developing land, so I haven't bought any toys. Keep telling people I'm going to buy me some pants with giant pockets because one day I'm going to be rich. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I mean, all of this sounds larger than life. Amazing. And Southern Utah is incredibly beautiful and so versatile and so many things to see. So for anyone who's interested, we'll put some links in the description so you can go check it out. And what's the name of the whole place? It's Pecan Valley Resort. Okay. There's a bunch of Pecan Farms down here. Pecan Valley Resort, and I believe that's your Instagram handle as well, Pecan Valley Resort. Again, we'll put the links in the description, but that's amazing. You were just like killing it at life, and I'm just so impressed with everything that you've been able to do, especially knowing the life that you came from and everything that you had to deal with there and just the way that you've blossomed and you're creating your own community without the polygamy. (laughs) Right. It's been amazing to have, have somebody like my wife there as we roll through this. Um, So after we had been gone for two years, I hadn't seen my mother or my sister. And um, so my mom calls me up and she said, Christopher, she said, your sister's getting investigated by CPS. And she said she was wondering, or she wondered if I'd be willing to represent her. She said I felt she felt like I was Gentile enough that I'd be able to communicate between them. Yeah, I was like, yeah, as I'd love to. I says, do you want to meet up sometime and talk about it? And she says, yes. Can you come now? And I said, sure, but I have a beard and short sleeves. And she says, that's fine. So I went inside to get the keys. And my little daughter was in there. She's now five. She was three when we left. And I says, hey, do you want to come see my mom? She said, sure. She's in a little parade dress and traditional <laughs> hairstyle. So I thought my mom would like to see that. And so we roll down there. It's like six houses away. They're big lots. So it's a couple blocks or whatever. So we get there and get inside. And mom's showing me stuff that she wants fixed up. And we're in one of the back rooms. And my sister comes to the door. I'm like, hey, sis, how's it going? I put out my hand. And she says, I'm not shaking your hand. I says, oh, you want a hug? And she says, no. She says, you shouldn't be here. The bishop doesn't want you here. You need to leave. And I'm like, no worries. It's good to see y'all. Like I understood their culture. It was so fun to see them for me. As I walked out of the house, my mom followed me because they're supposed to keep their house like a temple. So no non-members are supposed to be in there. So now I'm outside of the home, so I'm not desecrating it. So I talked to my mom and I told her how my daughter got married. My son was in school playing ball. And, and she says, Chris, I'm so happy for you. So I get out there in the truck and I'm just glad I got to see my mom. But my little five-year-old, she says, who is that lady that asked us to leave? And I says, well, that's my big sister. She says, why did she ask us to leave? And I says, well, we're not part of the same church anymore, so they don't want us in their home. And she just looked confused at me. And I says, well, they feel like we're bad, so they don't want us in their home. And so she thought about it for a second. She says, why don't you tell them we're good? And I thought it was so sweet, you know, how little kids think. Yeah, it's so simple. And I wish other people could recognize that. And I understand there's the indoctrination and everything that you were taught and told to believe about people who have left. And so I get it. But also, it really is that simple that you're not a different person just because you don't want to conform to the same standards or the same theology that they do. And so, yeah, it's kind of a bummer. But here we go. Live life. It's been amazing. 
Yeah. So with that, I need your Linda Listen moment, your sassy statement as the viral video with the toddler goes, or an inspirational statement for our viewers. I, I'm horrible at this stuff, so I don't know. <laughs> don't don't eat don't eat yellow snow. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Don't eat yellow <laughs> snow. If I had to pick a Linda listen for you, my overall takeaway from your story is live life for the present, not for some eternal reward or damnation that may or may not happen, but choose love, choose yourself, and choose the present. That's my Linda listen. I love them. <laughs> You're like, I second that. Linda listen, I second that. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. I'm not good at that stuff, so I appreciate it. Oh, no, it's been great. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing. It's been very enlightening. And I feel like we only scratched the surface, too. There's just so much to cover. And I'm hoping we can get some more of your family on to talk a little bit more about their perspective. So we'll see how that goes. Yeah, thanks for having me on. You've been a pleasure to talk to. You make it easy to share the stories. And oh, good. I appreciate everybody listening. Good. Uh, so I do like to share that. the story. It's been a cool adventure. You definitely have a lot of stories to tell. So I really appreciate you coming on and sharing. It's been awesome. So guys, thank you so much for watching. We really appreciate you watching these interviews, liking, commenting, helping the algorithm. Remember our guests to read the comments. So those words of encouragement do mean a lot. If you want to support the podcast, you can get some of our merch. Our top seller is, I'm sorry for what I said when I was in a cult. You can find that at cultsofconsciousness.com under the merch tab. We are announcing our first C2C vacation together. We are finalizing the details now. It is so exciting. If you want to be one of the first people to know about when it drops, because there will be limited spots, I'm going to put a link in the description where you can leave your email address so that you are notified the second that is live. We are going to be doing a live video though on the channel to discuss all of the details, where we're going, what we're doing, who's coming, and just really excited to talk to you guys about that. Um, so yeah, that's about it. And if you want to join our Patreon, you can do so at patreon.com slash cults to consciousness. Love your support over there as well. We try and do some exclusive live Q and A's for those who are signed up over there. And if you like this video, you will definitely want to check out these two below. And until next time, follow your highest excitement, be conscious and be well.